Well, I'd like to welcome all of you to Sunday service here at Ananda Village. All those who are here for the first time, our guests and visitors, and those visiting with us online from all over the world. This is, I'll read from Rays of the One Light. They are, it's written by Swami Kriyananda and based on the commentaries of the Bible and the Bhagavad Gita by Paramhansa Yogananda. This is week 35. Who are true Christians? Truth is one and eternal. Realize oneness with it in your deathless self within. The following commentary is based on the teachings of Paramhansa Yogananda. Jesus Christ said in chapter 10 of the Gospel of St. John, All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. Many Christians, not surprisingly, quote this saying in condemnation of other spiritual teachers. Not only the Old Testament prophets, but also Buddha, Krishna, and others who lived before Jesus, as well as, by inference, any who came after him. Yet Jesus himself said in St. Matthew chapter 5, Think not that I come to destroy the law, or the prophets, I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Nowhere do we find Jesus condemning or even gently criticizing other spiritual masters. His criticisms were reserved for worldly attitudes and for those hypocritical Pharisees who had allowed religion to become for them a pretense. Paramhansa Yogananda explained that the expression, all that ever came before me, referred to those spiritual teachers who placed their egos and their self-importance ahead of the Christ consciousness in the sense of drawing people's devotion to themselves and not offering it, offering it where alone it truly belongs to God. Yogananda himself was very firm in this regard for example, he never spoke of anyone as his disciple. Instead, he always insisted, they are God's disciples. God is the guru, not I. Ego is a way station on the soul's journey toward enlightenment. The soul is first trapped in lower bodily forms. Slowly it, emerged, it evolves to the human level, at which point self-consciousness appears. Only in human form can self-consciousness transcend material form altogether, including the lower identity of ego consciousness, and discover the true divine self within. Self-consciousness manifested as ego is an incentive to deliberate self-development. Later in this process of development, however, the ego becomes an obstruction. Inevitably, new spiritual aspirants do not emerge effortlessly from the vortex of ego consciousness. Desire must be offered up resolutely and ever more wholeheartedly on the altar of infinity. It is a gradual process, and even among those who seek to help others, and even and even though among those who seek to help others are free of ego. If, however, their motive in teaching is not to serve, but to be served, they deserve a severe reprimand, as Jesus gave them. For their direction of development is no longer upward, but downward. In the name of giving up desires, they are creating new ones. As it says in the Bhagavad Gita, in the third chapter, desire obscures even the wisdom of the wise. Their, restless, their relentless foe it is, and a flame never quenched. Intellect, mind, and senses, these combined are referred to as the seat of desire. Desire through them deludes and eclipses the discrimination of the embodied soul. O Arjuna, discipline your senses, and having done so, 
work to destroy desire, annihilator of wisdom and of self-realization. Give God the credit for everything you do. See him as the true doer. Thus, through Holy Scripture, God has spoken to mankind. Oh. is Nai Swami Pranava and this is Nai Swami Parvati. I'd like to read to you from Yogananda's Whispers from Eternity, his book of prayer demands. Divine Mother, may I feel thy heart throbs in my own heart, thy joy in my happiness, thy wise direction in all my activity, thy spirit in my soul. Divine Mother, I lay all the flowers of my love at the feet of eternity. O oh, open wide the flowers of my budding devotion and release thy fragrance that it may spread from my soul to the souls of others, ever whispering of thee. I pray to behold my love reflected in others. In the light of that greater love, may I behold thine unveiled face of perfect compassion. May I behold my true self in others that I perceive thee ever enthroned in our united hearts. At the heart of my whispered prayers, I feel stirring thy silent whispers. In the light of my burning candle of devotion, I behold at last thy sacred blaze of perfect love. O Divine Mother, unite our hearts as one heart, so that on the sacred altar of united hearts, we may find thy omnipresence enthroned, for, <clears throat> enthroned forever. <clears throat> in the autobiography of Yogi, um, there's a wonderful story that Yogananda uh, recalls on his journey to India in 1935, excuse me, that he, if you remember this part of the book, he voyaged through Europe. And specifically, one of the things he really wanted to do was visit the Catholic stigmatist, the Catholic mystic saint, Therese Neumann. And when he got there to the town, that she, the little village that she lived in, she wasn't there. And he got wind that she was visiting a professor that she was friends with some distance away. And so he went there and asked if he could see her. And she sent word to Yogananda that although the bishop always wants me to get his permission for people to see me, I will see this man of God from India. And it was really touching. And in the experience that they had together, if you've read the book, if you haven't read the book, certainly read the book by the end of the day. Um, <laughs> but it's very touching in that they're able to resonate at a very deep level, you know, much more than a casual encounter but deep in that respect that each other had for the real touch of spirit that they really were experiencing in their lives. Another inspiring story similar to that comes from the life of Frank Laubach, L-A-U-B-A-C-H. And there's a book that quite a few of us have read that again, I would suggest that all of us read uh, if it's in print. It's called Letters by a Modern Mystic by Frank Laubach. And they're letters from Frank Laubach to his father from the early 1930s. And Frank Laubach was a missionary in uh, 1915. He was probably in his late 20s that he and his wife moved to the Philippines to be missionaries. And indeed, he helped build a number of churches, uh, Christian churches in certain parts of the Philippines. And then in 1922 um, or so, he then founded and taught at the Union Theological Seminary in Manila. So he had already a lot going for him. But in his heart of hearts, he felt that there was something missing. And that was the call to reach out to the indigenous people of certain islands of the Philippines, the Mindanao Islands. And they were called the Moros. And the Moros were intensely Muslim faith-based people. And indeed, they viewed the Christian Philippines as their mortal enemies. 
it was that strong back in the 1930s. But Frank Laubach felt this call to be there. And he just was touched by who they were. The other thing that Frank Laubach is probably a whole lot more well known for is bringing literacy to the world at large. His Each One Teach One campaign brought people to be literate in their own languages. He wasn't teaching them English. He was helping to found a base of education where they could learn their own language and speak it and read it in a more fluent way. So because of that part of him, he was well respected by a lot of people. But in these islands in 1930, he was basically there alone. His wife and his child couldn't come for various reasons. And the Moros were not open to him being there. They really saw him as an outsider. Um, he wasn't well received in any way. They didn't visit him. They didn't acknowledge him. And so he recognized that. And it was because of that that his real gift to the world beyond his literacy education came about. He designed his life from that point on to intensely practice the presence of God in every moment possible. In every moment possible. And he really practiced that presence in moving ways. And in this book, Letters by a Modern Mystic, he recalls and gives us insights of what that looks like. You know, when he types a letter, when he makes a meal, does, does he lose that connection with God? But with the Muslims, he realized his purpose as a missionary was not to convert them. It was very deep an understanding. And I want to read to you from one of his letters back to his father. This is March 9th, 1930. I must approach these morals with a divine love which will speak Christ to them, though I never use his name. They must see God in me, and I must see God in them. Not to change the name of their religion, but to take their hand and say, Come, let us look for God. A few days ago, as we came on the priest, they were praying in one boat with 35 Moros, many of whom called me to join. So I held out my hands and prayed with them as earnestly as any of them. One of them said, he is Islam. And I replied, a friend of Islam. Just a, a very moving, meaningful experience of realizing that when we're talking about religion, its best intentions, its best possibilities are to inspire and invigorate us to come to the experience of God. But religion can be binding as well. There's a wonderful statement from the great sage Swami Vivekananda, the foremost disciple of the great master Ramakrishna, that it is a blessing to be born into religion unfortunate to die in one. Now I've heard that quoted slightly different by saying the second part of it that it's a curse to be to die in one. But that's not what Vivekananda meant. That's too extreme. There's no curse in dying in being a religious setting. But it's unfortunate that we don't move past it. That we don't see that the springboard of religion is there to make us dive into the ocean of cosmic consciousness. And so the real test of the question, who are true Christians, really comes down to who is alive in God. This wonderful thing here of, of Frank Lobach, to take their hand and say, come, let us look for God. That is the indicator of anyone that's true in their own religion, whatever that might be. Because if we adhere to the religion as our goal, it is unfortunate for us. But if we can tune into going to the depth of whatever religion we've come into, and we find the spirituality of that religion, the non-dual, true experience of whatever that is, then we will touch that 
in every religion. And perhaps you've had this experience, I've had it a number of times, with people that have been deep in their own religion, meaning that they've come to a real experience, a transcendence, at least towards that, that when I've conversed with them, there is this unwavering feeling that the truth is truth. There's no conditional truth that's being shared. The vocabulary may be different. The phrasing may be different. The concepts might be slightly different. But you can feel the resonance of that same truth in that experience. I know years ago, Parvati and I had the experience of a couple times um, having time with the Christian monastic, the Cistercian monastic, Thomas Keating, who's written a number of books. Um, and I don't know if he's still alive, actually. I think he, he was close to the same age as Swami Kriyananda, so I, I don't know. But the first time we met him was back in 1986. He was giving a talk that some friends of ours had sponsored. And most of the attendants were Christians. They were um, a lot of Episcopalians and Roman Catholics. And we had a chance to talk to Thomas Keating afterwards. And we were enjoying a little bit of conversation. And, and then he said, so what do you do? And we mentioned that we were ministers and spiritual directors of Ananda in Seattle, Washington. That's where the talk was being held by Thomas Keating. And he said, good, good. I hope you do a deep and, and inspiring work for people. But it was just that touch in that way. Well, years later, when we were the spiritual directors of Ananda in Portland, um, we got a call from someone that was organizing Thomas Keating's talks in Portland. It invited us to a small gathering with uh, Father Keating. And we said, for sure, because we knew him. And we're always wanting to enjoy the company of someone of that stature spiritually. And what he had assembled was a group of people from different spiritual traditions. I think there were some Buddhists and um, I forget who else. Um, but a pluralism of, of different spiritual paths. And for the most part in the beginning, he was sharing thoughts of the spiritual journey. And he had spent time in a Zen monastery um, a decade or so before that time. Um, and so he was familiar and he was conversant in many things. I think he'd been to India as well. Um, but his conversation with us uh, was deep, but it was in his own vocabulary, coming from the Christian tradition. And I thought, of course that's going to be the way that we naturally will converse. We're going to come from that which feels to be resonant in terms of our way of expressing it. But I could feel, and Parvati as well, and I think others in the room with him, we could feel that his words even transcended that vocabulary. That some of those concepts that you could see were, if, if you're looking at it from a certain perspective, were more from a dogma perspective. But in, in just being open to what he was saying and feeling the essence behind that expression, we could feel the depth of what he was conveying was the same if we were saying it just using different words. And then at the end, he allowed for some questions and answers, and it was more just a sharing at that point of interaction in that way. And I could see that some of the people weren't able to really feel necessarily that he had that transcendent quality, although his words were couched in the way that he was brought up in the Christian faith. And I could see there was some sort of tension there. And I thought that's really reflective of what goes on when we see the differences in what's going on in spirituality. Uh, probably most of you didn't see this uh, inspiring deep video clip from Thursday from uh, Tulsi Gabbard. She is the US Congresswoman from the state of Hawaii. And she's a Hindu. 
And Thursday was the official date of the celebration of John Mustany, the celebration of Krishna's birth. Interesting that it comes always around this time when this Sunday service topic happens. Who are the true Christians? Um, but it was a, you, sh you should see it. Just Google Tulsi Gabbard, G-A-B-B-A-R-D, -A -B -B -A Tulsi Gabbard. Um, very deeply inspiring. Because um, she has been attacked frequently for her Hindu faith, being an American. Her father was a Samoan and a Christian, a Roman Catholic. And her mother was uh, into the Hindu faith. And she was brought up in the Hindu faith, along with her four siblings, who also have Sanskrit first names as well. But she is running for her seat in the November, November election. And her opponent literally has called her the devil. And it's a matter of Christianity versus Hindu. Would you let the devil into your home? I mean, unbelievable. But with all of that happening in her life, when you see this video of her, it is transformative. She just talks about that the whole idea of what Krishna came to bring is the same as other religions, and that's of love. The enduring love that touches each one of us in a way that becomes meaningful, that's becoming real and more real as we grow in that experience. It's just, that's the way that we really see that as the Moros, the Muslims in the Mindanao Islands saying, he is Islam. And Frank Laubach said, no, I am friend of Islam. To be clear about it, that in that way. And in that way, we are friends of every person that is endeavoring to lift their spirits high, to live their lives with God. I had this dream the other night. It must have been because I was preparing for this service where I, I can't recall the details of it because I'm just remembering that I had it just now. So, um, <laughs> but, but this prompted me that um, it was a conversation. I don't remember with, if it was a person or a group of people, but we were talking about some of this that I'm talking about now. And, and they were saying, but you're talking about your God. And I remember in the dream saying, no, I'm talking about God. And they said, well, no. There's your God, and then I have my version of understanding God. And I said, well, but no, there's no scripture that really says that. It's the understanding through time that we've elected to view that as the way that our religion is. But in every religion, there's the emphasis of going beyond the description of God. Because even the best description of God is not God entirely. It's a means for us to find our way along the journey. So the coming from a point of disconnect, we start to, start to, at least in the beginning, to feel, I can approach it in this way. I can feel that God is this personage, or that this symbol, or this reflection, can be a way that I relate to God in that way. But it's only as a way to come into that which becomes our true experience. It is the oneness with God. As Jesus said, I and my Father are one. And when the Pharisees accost him and accuse him of blasphemy, when he says these things, his response is not to criticize them, belittle them, but he says, but your scriptures, they say, ye too are gods. And in the Hindu scriptures, which again, I've brought you know, a focus in a fundamental way to many Hindus, limiting what the, the teachings of Krishna are. The teachings say, aham brahm ashmi. 
I am in that oneness with Brahma. I am in that oneness with the divine. That has to be what we're really opening up to. And even we see that more in the distance out there. Always keep that in mind. Yogananda emphasized that even with our personal touch of the divine, how meaningful that will be to us, how deep that will be to us. Always keep that part of your awareness, part of your devotion, he said, as the infinite. To bring that personal experience always real so that we live in the moment, being touched, being transformed. But always keeping in mind, always keeping that devotion, the infinite beyond that form. Just to be always in that expansiveness that has no limitation, that has no definition, that isn't boxed in that this is my God. It becomes that there is no God even to experience because I am one with that experience. I am that experience in that way. So my invitation to all of us, in the words of Frank Laubach, is come, let us look for God. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed who thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for Blessed are the peacemakers, they shall be called the children of God. Bless those reviled for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven.